I often get asked, what does journalism of the future look like? And that for me is a very simple question to an inc incredibly complex situation. Because you see, in order to accurately assess what the future looks like, we need to first understand it in its present context. And in today's context, you are presented with options. You have content curated to your needs. You have a choice. So if I'm going to talk on journalism, it's only fair that I present you with the choices of what you like to read. How about, um, you know, 10 scandals that rock the world of journalism? I know we all need something juicy to bite into every now and then. Or um, 15 of the most hilarious social media posts. I mean, we could all use a good laugh, right? But you see, this right here, while this seems superficial and trivial, there's a reason behind this. We're all tempted to click into all these kind of headlines. It's called clickbaits, because you're lured into it. The traditional term for it was yellow journalism. Sensational headlines with little substance. But this right here, this is a symptom. It's not the disease. So what's happened? What's happened to this golden era of journalism as we know it? When most people are asked to perceive what they think of journalism, they see this. They think it's writing. Now, that's not entirely inaccurate, but that's a very simplistic overview. Because if you ask me where journalism really begins, it begins with this one word. Why? A very simple word which can raise profound questions. This can raise profound questions. Questions such as, why are we here? Somewhat existential in nature. Or, why is the sky dark at night? Or, why do we even fall in love? I know we've all been there. And sometimes the questions are not so profound, especially when they're a little more childlike like these. But you see, there's something in common between the philosophical questions and the juvenile questions. There is an innate level of curiosity. And it's this curiosity that's actually at the core of journalism. Because it's this curiosity that eventually leads to information gathering, which leads to storytelling, which over a period of time builds up to what I consider the most underrated aspect of journalism, that is domain knowledge. Veteran journalists are masters of domain knowledge. You can spend hours of coffee over them, seriously. But storytelling is very important. You see, these kind of stories have enchanted us right from the time that we are children. Because these stories, in whatever language you heard them, give you allegories, they give you anecdotes. They give you morals to relate to. And that's what made journalism a popular profession, the art of relevant storytelling. But let's go one step further. What's made journalism a noble profession? You see, journalism, or rather the free press, sees itself as the fourth estate of democracy. They're meant to be the guardians, the watchdogs, that keep various institutions in check. They're meant to inform and educate you on not just on what you want to know, but more importantly, on what you need to know. So all this sounds fine, right? Journalism is the Batman cleaning up your Gotham cities. Why is there a cause for concern? Journalism today has become very anachronistic in nature. What do I mean by this term, anachronism? I mean, it seems like a mouthful to swallow, right? Anachronism is something that's misplaced in time and history. This is the oldest recorded source of journalism. It's the Acta Diana circulated in ancient Rome in 59 BC. Just to put this time frame of 59 BC into context, this was back when Julius Caesar was still alive and December 25th wasn't yet known for Christmas. So because journalism has always existed since time memorial, it assumes it will exist in the traditional sense. But that's not fully true. And you are the examples of that. Who here, show of hands, can last remember when they saw the 9 p.m. news this week? Precious little. Or oh, the 8 p.m. news? How about the 7 p.m. news? Moving to print, who here right now has a hard copy of today's paper? I'm not doing a ratings or circulation check, but the very fact that the sacrosanctity of watching the 9 p.m. bulletin or reading the morning paper is no longer there. And it doesn't make you any less informed, because you have content on demand. What you want, when you want, how you want it. In the medieval era, this worked very differently. What was precious was rare, in the hands of a select few. 
The access that we have to information today is indeed precious, but it's no longer rare. Because when your world was radio, television, and print, you depended on these people to form your worldviews. Your worldviews were restricted. It was one-way information traffic. Today, the irony is the same technology that's proliferated journalism, I mean, you don't have to be in New York to read the New York Times, has also disrupted it. We're still consuming more news today, but it's not coming from newsrooms, so where's it coming from? Yeah. You know of these platforms very well, but what you may not know of is the fact that you consume more news today on these platforms than you did last decade from traditional media sources. And the whole outlook of the landscape has changed because breaking news today is Twitter. 140 characters is a tweet. A tweet today is the first form of breaking news, long before it hits the paper the next day, long before it hits the news wires or before an anchor can scream breaking news. A tweet is the first form of breaking news. That is the beauty of it. And then there's one more beauty of Twitter. You have access to this. <laughs> you no longer need to be his best friend or win Miss World to get to know him. Twitter out said, this is veracity. You can use this as official statements. So all this seems fine. If content has been democratized, it's easily accessible to all. It's readily abundant. Simple economics tells us that if you no longer provide anything unique, you're in some sort of financial peril. Another Clinton who secured his place in the White House has his campaign immortalized this campaign slogan. It's the economy, stupid. It seems rather facile, it seems rather simple. But there is a bigger, profound meaning in this. You see, this economy values services, but it's also an economy that decides the victors from the vanquished. It's an economy which decides that values consumerism. It's an economy that values lavish spending. It's an economy that values technological innovation. And content, sadly, has become a cheap commodity in all this. This one realization hit me hard. My own journal entry into journalism was a rather serendipitous affair. I came through a show called Dream Job, which was a hunt for the next sports broadcaster. It was sort of a reality show. Think of a less talented version of American Idol, with, except for sports broadcasting. But what this meant was I was selected as part of 18 people among 100,000 applicants after a couple of rounds of grueling auditions. And I would go through several ways of living the life of a sports broadcaster. I would talk to a wide audience like this on television, I would interview sports celebrities, and I'd go out and cover sports stories. And all this seemed to be the big pivot I needed to get into journalism full time. I used this opportunity to get into journalism school, used this opportunity to intern with the same broadcaster, and then eventually landed a role as a sports journalist. The mother of all ironies was, even though I came through a show called Dream Job, my actual job was a nightmare job. It's not because of the, the fatigue of long hours or the hard taskmaster bosses. It's just that I came thinking I knew sports content, I knew journalism, I knew television, I knew where all these platforms met. The base level of the pyramid was sealed. It was only going to be one way up. Only to realize that the company's economic model didn't work on people in new sports stats. There was no way of rhapsodizing sports stats or rattling off when this incident happened or what color tie this sports star wore that really built economic models of the company. Clinton was right. It was the economy, stupid. And I didn't get it. So I was stupid for that. It's not just the monetization models that are broken as well. It's also the fact that monetization has become incredibly hard today. This is Paul Krugman, New York Times economist. He's also a Nobel Prize winning economist. If I were to give you a little experiment here today that said these five articles by Paul Krugman would change the way you think on economics. It would change the way you think on international affairs. The economic geek in you would jump around excitedly and say, let me at it. I want to read it right away. But if I were to put a caveat and said to read this, you have to pay a subscri subscription fee of 100 bucks. You take a step back and let your subconscious mind dictate. And your subconscious mind would tell you, 100 bucks. For 100 bucks, you can get a couple of taxi rides, a couple of greasy stuff at Sloppy Joe's, and uh, the happiest of happy hours here. So what's happened right here? 
you've refused to pay for this content not because you know there's a better version of the story out there. You know there's a freer version of the story out there. It's sad that in knowledge economy, it's knowledge that's hardest to monetize today. And apart from the monetization models, it's the revenue models that are hurt and broken. You see, back in the day, the advertisers needed newspapers as the sole conduit to get to you, the end consumer. It was almost as if newspapers printed money. But today, this is what we say of newspapers. For advertisers, newspapers today is a very temporary medium. It's almost money literally down the drain, especially if you toss that paper down the drain. It's not a long-lasting medium. And even though newspapers think they've mitigated this by going digital, advertisers today have a lot more options. They don't necessarily need to come to you. It's not just digital marketing. We live marketing in a digital world. We live by that philosophy. And that's why newspapers are struggling. They have 40% less revenue today than they did in 2000 because 75% of the ad revenue has vanquished. So, back to where we were. What is journalism of the future? And after a while, you get sick of hearing this and you want to retort, if you knew what the news was tomorrow, you would actually be rich. And you wouldn't need a crystal ball for that. But as a business reporter, what really hits me hard is the fact that when I go out there and I try to interview someone, I realize that the real change agent is on the other side of the microphone the chief investment officer of a bank investing in the next hottest emerging market, the chief technological officer of a cybersecurity company helping industries fend off new attacks, the entrepreneur creating a collaborative consumption app simplifying your life and my life, or even the venture capitalist who's investing in that app. Journalism is still there to record these events, but it's become more of a silent spectator. It's become endless copies of churning out stuff. We live more in an era of journalism. We're there to record events, but we're no longer actively playing the role of the change agent. And it wasn't always this way. There was a longing back for the yesteryear of good journalism. Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, you know them better as the reporters who broke the famous Watergate story. You see, if it weren't for these guys who brought down the most powerful man in the world, former US President Richard Nixon, Richard Nixon could have had a second term in office and the spate of world affairs and the spate of world economy could have lot, looked a lot different. Over four years of investigative journalism, they did manage to change the course of history. And we will still see an Edward Snowden, we'll still see a Panama Papers, we'll still see a WikiLeaks, but investigative journalism is still an outlier. It's no longer the norm. But John Oliver perhaps says it better than I can. He did a sketch where he kind of presents the story of journalism. I'm hearing there's corruption in City Hall. Only a newsroom willing to stop at nothing can uncover the truth. And it might go all the way to the top. All the way to the top? They knew. And I think we can prove that they knew. Yeah, I'm just not sure what kind of clicks we're going to get on that. Yeah. Anybody else? I got a thing about a cat that looks like a raccoon. Oh, or it could be a raccoon that looks like a cat. Wait, I'm not sure. Now we're talking. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Let's okay. figure that out. Okay, great. Yeah, maybe an online poll. It's like political that. corruption in Boston. We'll come back to that if we have time. But uh, I like the rat cat. Oh, rat cat. That's great. Rat. Let's blow the roof off that. See, that jaded reporter's face is a metaphor for journalism of the yesteryear. One where he's not just struggling to understand the external forces, but losing a battle to the internal forces. That's what sometimes they say about journalism. We all enter as idealists, hoping to make change, hoping to be change agents. But eventually, we may just depart to the side as cynics. So the choice is simple. We're left with a few options today. Journalism is in the ocean. It's drowning. Currents are high. What do we do? Do we throw in a life raft and try to reel it in? Do we just let it be and see the currents float out and, you know, Maybe journalism evolves into a swimmer, or evolves into a version 2.0, something that we could enjoy. That could happen. Or do we just let it subside and just watch it drown? True to my profession, the questions are mine. The answers are up to you. Thank you. <laughs>